beauty of the internet is that it's a, a kind of lecture theatre and um, people can come and listen to the lectures or they don't or they can go away and leave the lectures or they can ignore them or they can say that the lecturer is an idiot or they can do what they like it's great it's great it's a it's a lecture theater which is open to everybody and it's so easy for me to sit here and just give you a lecture uh, which i intend to do then you can watch it or not as you like but what i have to say is extremely important and it's it's almost critically important I mean I've been going on and on about radiation I've been going on this, this woman here looking at me as if I'm mad the French woman walking along the towpath here talking to myself it seems anyway I'll get on with it what I want to talk about is not radiation but about what is behind radiation what is it that that um, pro provides this um, barrier between common sense and, and truth, if you like, and policy. Because it's absolutely clear, you know, to go back to radiation, that the errors in the analysis of the effects of radiation on human health are just so manifest and profound and enormous that millions and millions of people have died as a result of these errors. Now, it could be that behind it all are a bunch of crooks and in fact certainly some people are there who I believe know better and do know that their activities are killing people but they're prepared to go along with it for power and influence and money and so on and we can argue about that as well we can argue about why it is that some people need power and influence and money I don't incidentally and I know many people who don't many people so there's obviously something in uh, human nature that's gone wrong for some people, but not others. But anyway, that's a different lecture. The lecture I want to give now is going to be fairly short, and it's going to be about physics. Because what I've realized is that the last century, and continuing now into this century, is the era of truth as advanced by physics, or mathematics, if you like. But mathematics in itself is, is harmless. Mathematics is just a, it's like a calculator, you know. You give it a problem and it gives you an answer. Uh, and that's great that we've developed mathematics, or the human race has developed mathematics, so you can give complex problems and get, and get correct answers. But as a physicist, as the, as the computer engineers and the computer programmers used to say, garbage in, garbage out. And where mathematics attaches itself to the analysis of reality, if I might call it that, we have a problem. And that problem is in the realm of physics. Because in the realm of chemistry and in the realm of biology and engineering and electronics, you don't get very far unless your theories actually produce something that works. So if you mix a green liquid with a blue liquid and get a red precipitate, you will also, it will, that will always happen so long as you do that. But what physics tries to do is it tries to analyze all this. It tries to analyze all of this, this universe, in terms of mathematics. And when it tries to do that, it, 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 it falls down. It, it cracks up. And I'll come to that. But first of all, let's consider the physicists. I've met an awful lot of physicists since I've been doing this work on ionizing radiation and health. And I have to say that the ones that work in this area, uh, and most, a lot of them call themselves health physicists, are a pretty dumb bunch. They are not at all really scientists. They're more like uh, technicians, I guess. They apply equations that somebody else hands them. They read books and they follow rules. And these rules are laid down by theories which eventually track back to people like the International Commission on Radiological Protection. And those are the people who apply physics to living systems. Well, of course, you can't apply physics to living systems. And that's a problem. So I've, come, I've talked about this until you're all bored to death about it. But I'm more interested in, in, in the physicists themselves. Because what, what physics has done in this last 
century, not, not the one we're in now, but the previous one, is it's taught human beings to, to give way to impossible ideas on the basis that they must be right, on the basis that mathematics says that they're right. And this is the most extraordinary thing because it has left everybody powerless to use their own common sense, their, their own understanding of the world uh, as they live in it. They can no longer do this. Now here's somebody more coming past. They see uh, that I'm, uh, I'm talking to myself. They must think I'm insane. Bonjour. Or maybe you'll think I'm insane too when you listen to what I have to say. It's a, it's a classic example of Anderson's Emperor's New Clothes story. Nobody is prepared to admit that they're not clever enough to understand what the physicist is telling them. Or very few people have the have the have the inner strength to to believe that the physicists are wrong. And there are two major areas in which the physicists tell us stuff which is actually offensive to common sense and offensive to everything that we know about how the world works. It's totally insane stuff. And these two areas are relativity and quantum theory. I, actually, I used to teach quantum theory, so I know about quantum theory, and I'm not going to talk about quantum theory. Actually, quantum theory you can deal with. That's not such a big deal. But what is a big deal is relativity, because what relativity has, has handed us is such a load of nonsense that we are forced to believe, and that the physicists now still believe, despite the fact that they've been totally unable to understand the universe as interpreted through relativity. And that's what they do. They, they interpret the universe through, through relativity. So they look out there with their telescopes and they see all these stars and they apply relativistic equations. And what do they find? They find that the universe doesn't make sense. And not, in, not, not slightly, not like, not like some small amount of not making sense, but a gigantic amount of not making sense. They've lost about 90%, I believe, of all of the matter in the universe. They don't know what it is. They call it dark matter, but they don't know what it is. They can't find it. And then now they've lost a load of energy as well. So they, they call it dark energy. So there's this frantic search for dark matter and dark energy. Anybody coming along and looking at this from the outside would fall about laughing. But they aren't falling about laughing. They're dragging down huge amounts of money in research funds to make enormous telescopes to look even further into the universe to see if they can find this dark matter. And, 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 all, and, and every now and again they find some tiny little piece of information which, which makes them realize that, that even where they are now is, 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 not, is not anywhere real. But nobody decides to go back and see what the problem is. Well, here's the problem. The problem is relativity. And I'm not going to go on endlessly about it, but a number of people have drawn attention to the problems of relativity. So I'm going to say a little bit about it, these problems, and then you can go away and think about it or talk to your favorite physicists about it. Whenever I meet a physicist at a party, I hand him one or two of these ideas and they get so angry. They get so angry. They won't speak to me. They, they huff and they puff. They can't they can't answer these things. So there, there are three paradoxes that I'm going to hand you about relativity. Now, the, what relativity has handed us is these impossible concepts of space-time and curved gravitational fields and, and bendy universes and uh, 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 multiple dimensions, five dimensions, Riemannian geometry, Minkowski's analysis of Einstein's general relativity equations. These different dimensions and so we have all these Star Trek movies where you go through this dimension and you come out in that dimension and all these dimensions okay well let's forget the dimensions for now but just remember that what the physicists had taught us after Einstein was that there was a lot of very clever stuff there that we couldn't understand and that it resulted in ideas that were impossible but we had to believe and this is where physicists always start. This is what they're taught. And it makes them feel clever. This is the point. It, it separates them from everybody else. So they think, I am a physicist. I know about space-time continuums. Or is it continua? I know that the velocity of light is constant in all reference frames. Total impossibilities. And in fact, a number of people have pointed out how impossible they are. And a lot of physicists around about the time of Einstein never believed in the theory of relativity, of special relativity, which is the basis 
of the general relativity theories. Lorentz, for example, very clever guy, guy who invented the equations, in fact, that Einstein used in order to explain the uh, observations, and we'll come to the observations briefly too, but let's give you these, so, that, so we started with this idea that the physicists have been able to snow everybody with the idea that they can say anything, and because we are not physicists, we're not experts, we're not mathematicians, and I am incidentally able to deal with this, this mathematics, but because of this we somehow can't argue, and this is why these people who are politicians are frightened of physicists. They're frightened of them. And you'll find that most of the, 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 the people who've been put into places of, of where they're advising governments on policy are physicists. And they can say anything they like. And they say, the, sci the scientific consensus says that blah, blah, blah. And of course the poor uh, humanities people, or lawyers, or whoever they are, you know, who are the politicians, they can't, they can't argue because they don't know, so they have to say, well, all right, we go along with you. And all on the basis of this special relativity, in my opinion. That's where it started, with Einstein and his crazy hair. All right, let's go. The, the, you, know, you know that the basis for special relativity, or why it was developed, is because there were these experiments made by Michelson and Morley which showed that the velocity of light uh, was not a function of its direction. So in other words, the, the material that, that, was supposed, that had been postulated to support the, light, the vibrations of light in the universe didn't exist. And this was an experiment done in the late 1900s with, equi with equipment which wasn't so fantastic. But anyway, what they found was that within the limits of experimental error, it, uh, there was no such thing, or there was no ether drift. Now the ether is this universal medium that was postulated to support the uh, vibrations of, of light. You know, light is a wave, okay? Well, we know light is a photon also, but light has to be supported by something, and you have to have action at a distance and so on. So it was a bit of a problem there. Uh, and, what and then Lorentz came along and he said, well, of course, we can deal with this problem if we assume that there's a universal medium and, and that it can be contracted in the direction that you're, you're, you're moving. So, in other words, you have, you have variations in the lengths of measuring rods and that sort of thing. And then Einstein comes along and he says, no, no, we don't need all of this, you know, we can just consider the concept of simultaneity. Uh, and if you do so, and you do lots of interesting thought experiments involving simultane simultaneity, you know, the idea of something be happening at the same time here and at the same time there, in, in frames of reference that were moving relative to one another, you can dispense with the ether altogether. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. I don't know how anybody believed it. Anyway, they did. It was an emperor's new clothes phenomenon, you know, so the people who believed it were very clever and the people who didn't believe it were thick. And remember all this was happening round about the time of the First World War and round about the time when people were giving up on religion because of Darwin and there was no, there was nothing that you could hold on to, you know, things fall apart, the centre cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. And then what rough beast, it's our come round at last, was, was Einstein, was relativity. Anyway, there's some par there are two paradoxes about relativity which blow it out of the water instantly. And the first is the twins paradox. I mean, the, the equations of relativity, of special relativity, will tell you that if you go close to the speed of light, all sorts of strange things happen. In, happen. And, and everyone will tell you that from the equations, if you're sitting on the Earth and there are two twins, one remains on the Earth and the other one whizzes off at a tremendous speed and comes back, they will have aged, the, the one that whizzes off will be younger than the one that stays on Earth when he comes back. Okay, this is what the equations tell you. But since there's no preferred, so and this is the paradox, okay, because everybody swallows this bollocks, you know, everybody at school is taught this stuff, well not school, but you know, when, university, when you get to Rose, incidentally my daughter tried to study uh, natural sciences at Cambridge and she had to put up with this nonsense and she just gave up in the end, she couldn't, she just couldn't argue it, she went and did social anthropology, very wise, very wise. But of course, you know, all the physicists and the, the men, the mathematicians, they all laughed at her. You know, silly woman, of course, can't do mathematics. Doesn't understand these difficult, arcane subjects. But that's by the way. 
So the, the point is that if one twin goes off and then comes back and he's younger than the second twin, that immediately introduces an asymmetry into, this, into the system. And if you step back from that, you're not allowed to put an asymmetry in the system, according to Einstein's first postulate, because there's no preferred reference frame. So there's no reason why the one on Earth, then, can't be seen as traveling away from the one who went off at, at, at 186,000 miles per second, or whatever it was. Okay? So the one that flies off from Earth at a huge speed it cannot be considered necessarily to be a preferred twin. So he doesn't age at a le less rate than the one on Earth, because if you consider it from the other point of view that the Earth twin moves off on the Earth away from the other guy at 186,000 miles per second, he becomes the chosen twin just on the question of deciding which twin to put into the equation. You see what I mean? It's just absolutely to do with the mathematics, what you put in at the beginning. So he's the one that is younger now. Well, they, ca they can't both be younger, can they? I mean, that's impossible. So end of relativity as far as that's concerned. So that paradox, the twins paradox, was first advanced by Professor Herbert Dingle, who was Professor of History and Philosophy of Science at Imperial College in London, in a book called Science at the Crossroads, uh, which was published in the 60s. So I'm not the only one to point out this nonsense about relativity, okay? There's, there, there's a very eminent scientist who also did this. And of course he was shot down. Of course everybody attacked him and the mathematicians jumped on his head and so on. And of course, you know, everybody thought that's the end of that. He's forgotten. All right, second paradox. The second paradox I prefer, I mean partly because I invented it, it's called the shotgun paradox. Now you must, if you know anything about relativity, what you have to know is that if you're measuring the speed of light in any reference frame, you always get the same answer. This was Einstein's first postulate. So it doesn't matter how fast you're going relative to something else, or, or, uh, or, or what velocity you have relative to any reference frame, but if you measure the speed of light in your reference frame, you will always get the same answer, C, three times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second, or whatever it is. Okay, so I want you to now imagine uh, Two, yes, and the reason that you always get the same m measurement, C, is because of the, the, what's called the Lorentz contraction. So your measuring rods all contract. So if you're, because if you're, you know that speed is distance over time, so you have, in order to measure the speed of light, you have to measure the time it takes to travel a certain distance. Well, of course, if the distance is contracting because you're, you're going fast, then, of course, you're, you, you will still get C. And, that, and, that, and that's how they explain the... Um, the observation. That's how they explain the observation. And there's a whole set of equations called the Lorentz equations, you know, V equals 1 minus the square root of V squared over C squared and so on. And your mass alters and everything. Very famous um, limerick. There was a, a young man called Fisk whose fencing was exceedingly brisk. So fast was his action that Lorentz contraction reduced his rapier to a disc. So in other words, at, at, at the speed of light, the, 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 the length of, of the measuring rod becomes infinitely small. Okay, so back to the shotgun. Just imagine an over and under shotgun. You've got two very long tubes, not really a shotgun, okay, but anyway, look, it's like a shotgun. So these are two very long tubes which are connected to each other, welded, if you like, welded to each other, one over the top of the other. The lower tube is focused, is focused on, a, on a light source on the Earth. This whole thing is sitting on the Earth. And the upper tube is focused on a distant star, which we assume that the Earth is moving towards or away from. It has a velocity relative to this distant star. So light from the distant star travels through the upper tube, and light from a light bulb travels through the lower tube. This is a thought experiment, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to chop the beams with a chopper. So we're going to start them and stop them. So we're going to switch them on, switch them off, just by putting a piece of cardboard in the way, if you like. And so then when we switch them on, the light will get the, 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 the light will shoot down the tube and then we measure the time it takes to get to the end of the tube. Now obviously since the light from the distant star is traveling with a different velocity relative to Earth than the light on the Earth, because the star and the Earth are moving relative to each other, in order for the measurement on Earth to be made in such a way that that light um, has the same velocity, because of course we can't have a different velocity, in all reference frames remember, 
all the light, light speeds are always the same. So in order for the light from the distant star to have, this, uh, a different to have the same velocity as the light in, down the, the lower tube, the earth light, the upper tube contracts according to the velocity of the earth relative to the star. And it contracts by the equation, the Lorentz equation, L equals L naught over 1 minus uh, the square root of V squared upon C squared. Anyway, it's a very slight contraction. So if you keep chopping this, now of course you know that if the, if the, top, one contra if the top tube contracts because of the Lorentz contraction and the bottom tube doesn't contract because there's no Lorentz contraction, you've got like a bimetallic strip. So they have to move, they have to bend like this relative to each other. Okay? And so what we then do is we chop the beam with a chopper, chop, 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 and that makes it bend at the same rate as the chopper. And it whips backwards and forwards, and then we connect that to a, um, a piezoelectric uh, crystal, and we generate electricity. <laughs> or something like that. We get useful work. We get useful work out of measuring the speed of light. Isn't that great? Of course, that contravenes the first law of thermodynamics. And so what you've done here is you've absolutely put Einstein, you've put the uh, special relativity up against thermodynamics. Now, nothing, nothing contravenes the, th the laws of thermodynamics. That's it, so for physicists anyway. So when physicists have the laws of thermodynamics put, put up against the laws of relativity, uh, their heads explode. So that's what you've got to do at the next party when you talk to a physicist, all right? Anyway, this is quite entertaining, but also it's really quite serious. It's really quite serious. And so, and so, what is the answer then? What is the answer? Why, why are the light, is the light not the same in the two directions in the Michelson interferometer? What is it that supports light in the universe? Well, the answer is simple. It is the ether. It's just that Michelson got it wrong. He never measured it. He didn't measure it because his instruments were not good enough. It's as simple as that. Isn't that extraordinary? Extraordinary. And how do we know that? Because somebody else did. A chap called Miller in America did an enormous series of experiments with all sorts of interferometers on the top of Mount Wilson. He was, um, he was funded by, by the Chase, uh, of the, of Edward Chase, I think he is, of the Chase Manhattan Bank, rich guy. He put tents on the top of mountains. He measured, uh, he measured the speed of light using every possible system. And what he found with an enormous and clever series of experiments is that there is an ether and that the Earth um, is, is moving through the ether at, at a significant velocity towards the constellation Hercules. And he published his results in physical review letters, I believe. You can find it on the internet. Miller. Put in Miller Relativity. You'll find all his papers. So isn't that an extraordinary story? To me, it's an extraordinary story, and what it tells me is that the whole of the physical understanding of the universe is nonsense. It's just nonsense. And yet these people still hold sway over the minds of, of, of you and me, and the minds of the politicians. And they're still able to tell us, on the basis of mathematics, that we should do this and we should do that. It's such a laugh. Anyway, that's the end of this lecture. The next one will be on quantum theory. But quantum theory is much more fun. And quantum theory doesn't hold out any real um, perils for us. The perils that I, want to talk, that I wanted to talk about are the perils of assuming that physicists know what they're talking about. Because they don't. They don't know what they're talking about. They're stupid. They have made themselves stupid in some curious way by embracing mathematics, and math all that mathematics can do is it can deal with what you put into it. And because what you put into it very often is wrong, or very often is oversimplified, because it's just taken as a little bit out of reality, and then it gives you an answer about that little bit, and then all it does is it tells you something that, that, that actually may not be the answer to your question. And in the case of ionizing radiation, which is where I come in, it isn't. Anyway, here we are, on my little boat, down in the middle of France. And so this is another one of my lectures from Marius. Thank you for listening.